Welcome to the Wilson Center's program on our pioneering Space Force. I'm Mark Kennedy, a fellow here at the Wilson Center, focused on our geopolitical strategic competition, as well as a civic leader for the U.S. Air and Space Forces. We're very pleased to have with us General Jay Raymond, the, who is the first commander of the Space Command, as well as the first Chief of Space Operations. General, we are, this is part of a program that is sponsored by the Science, Technology, and Innovation Program here at the Wilson Center, led by Elizabeth Newberry, that also sponsors the Across Carmen blog. General Raymond is a, a native Virginia, but a very proud graduate of Clemson University. When he graduated in 84 and was commissioned as an Air Force officer, his first assignment was Grand Forks, North Dakota, where he and his wife were recently both honored by the University of North Dakota, where I was humbled to be a president earlier. He, his last assignment in the Air Force was at Peterson, then Sp Air Force Base, now Space Force Base, where I got to work with him when I was president of the University of Colorado. He became the first lead for the Space Command in just three years ago, but soon after that was assigned to be the first Chief of Space Operations. We're thrilled to have him with us here today and learn more about the great things that the Space Force is doing to secure our country. Let's begin, if we could, General, by talking about why was it important that we establish a Space Force? What are the threats out there that the president and the nation and the Congress decided that we need to have a new branch for our military? Well, first of all, Mark, thanks for the opportunity to be with you. And it's always good to see you. And I appreciate uh, uh, all the support that you've given uh, the Air and Space Forces over the year and over the years. And again, it's, it's a privilege to be here. So back in uh, 2019, uh, the United States decided to capitalize on an opportunity, an opportunity to uh, elevate space to a level that was commensurate with its importance to national security. And uh, you know, there's nothing that we do as a, as a nation or as a joint and a coalition force that isn't enabled by space. We've had the luxury over many decades of treating space, largely since the end of the Cold War, of, of, of treating space as a given, that it, you know, it's a benign, peaceful domain, uh, and that we could just operate there uh, uh, without without uh, any uh, any worries, if you will. Uh, clearly, that's not the case today. Uh, we say that uh, space has become more congested, has become more competitive, and has become more contested. And the thought was, while we're still the best in the world in space, if we elevate this uh, to a service level, uh, just like we have in all other domains, where you have a service, the United States Army focused on the on the ground domain, you have an Air Force that's focused on the, the air domain and the, and the naval uh, force that's focused on the maritime domain. Uh, if you had a service that came to work every day focused on the space domain, we could uh, elevate its importance and, and accelerate and stay ahead of, of uh, the strategic environment uh, that we saw emerge. And not everybody fully realizes how important space is to us. When we get up in the morning and we look at the weather and we look at what is the time to commute, we don't realize how dependent we are on space, and in turn, how dependent all of the other branches in the military are on space. How do you explain just how important space is to us as individuals, as well as to the broader effort for the Department of Defense? I think I'll, I'll even broaden it even beyond that and start with, it's really important for our nation. Uh, space underpins every instrument of our national power, whether it be diplomatic uh, information, the military, uh, or, or, or the economy. And, and again, as it underpins all of that, it's, it's critical that just as you, as you walk in a room and turn the lights on, the lights are always on, it's very important that uh, space is always on as well for our nation. And so if you, if you look at it from a, a national security Point of military point, you're looking at it through one lens of multiple lenses uh, of, of, of an area where, where where space is really important. If you, I just had an opportunity to visit uh, John Deere Tractor uh, Company in Des Moines, Iowa, 
And I always thought of John Deere Tractor Company as a, as a tractor company. Well, what I realized when I visited them is they're a, really a data company that also sells tractors. They transform themselves. And the power that of information to the, the global agricultural business is significant. It, it increases food supplies. It, it reduces uh, uh, pesticides. It, it, it really is a significant force multiplier for the agricultural community. Uh, it is also a force multiplier uh, for the military. And on the military side, all of our other services force structure are all built around the assumption that you have assured access to space. And again, uh, and without that, uh, we don't have enough airplanes. We don't have enough ships. We don't have enough tanks. Space is a great deal for our nation, great deal for our military. And that's why it's so important uh, that, that we, uh, that we uh, make sure that it's always there. It's also very important for every American uh, if space fuels our American way of life. And it's hard to understand that because it's hard to have a connection with space. It's, you know, there are machines orbiting thousands of miles overhead going, you know, 17,500 miles an hour in low Earth orbit. And it's hard to have that connection. But most people uh, use space, you know, multiple times before they have their first cup of coffee. As you said, if, they, if they're checking the weather, if they're on their smartphone, they're using space. If they're doing any kind of internet or uh, uh, electronic banking they're using space if they're uh, it, the list goes on and on the the timing signal from gps satellite really synchronizes this information age that we live in and so uh, from big picture every instrument of national power to focusing on on the military part that's really critical and everything we do from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to to combat is is has space integrated throughout and then as as american citizens we use space each and every day. It's hard to understand. It's hard to have that connection, but it's there. And as our tensions have been increasing around the world, the capabilities that the other forces are looking to Space Force has been multiplying. Not just the communications or weather or missile defense or GPS, but now increasing more intelligence as to what's going on on the ground, in the air, and the maritime. Maybe you could talk about how your, your demands from the other forces are increasing in line with the increasing tensions that we're seeing globally. Yeah, it's interesting, the question that you just asked about, you know, how do you, um, the importance to every, every American, and it might not be as visible. Uh, on the inside the Pentagon, that conversation is really easy. Everybody understands the criticality of space and everybody is saying, uh, here, here's what we need. Uh, with the stand-up the establishment of a space force, a couple of things have happened that I think have really been beneficial. First of all, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, has has designated uh, the space force chief as the as the force design uh, architect, if you will, uh, for the department to, to pull all that together, do all the analytical work, and then feed up through the Secretary of Defense for a decision what what that force design would look like. Uh, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, the JROC, also um, has identified the Space Force as the lead integrator for space across across the joint, uh, all the services, or the Joint uh, Space Integrator. And so for the first time, you now have a service that is pulling that together, bringing unity of effort across the department uh, to make sure that we can provide those capabilities that our other, that our other services need. That's, that's what we're in the business of doing. We are, we are wanting to make sure that we can provide uh, uninterrupted access to critical uh, space capabilities uh, that, that our services and our joint forces and coalition partners have all come to rely on and, and all provide great advantage to, the, to those uh, folks. And so uh, when I deployed uh, a hand, well, back in 2006 timeframe, uh, when I came home from that deployment, a lot of folks asked me, what's the one thing that warfighters need uh, from space. And when I came back from that, that's not what I took away. It's not the one thing. It's multiple things. It's everything that we do as a joint force has space uh, integrated into it. And, you know, if you're, if on the Air Force side, uh, if you're, you know, going to take an, an aircraft off uh, to go on a mission, you know, the, the space provides the, uh, the ability to figure out where the target is, space uh, provides precision weapons, space provides communications to be able to command and control, uh, space provides battle damage assessment. Throughout the entire uh, portion of that mission, 
space is integrated throughout. So it wasn't one thing, it's multiple things. The interesting thing is as, as access to space has, or, or barriers to entry to space have been reduced and smaller satellites now are more operationally relevant, uh, you see many mission areas now that will have a, have a, a space solution to it, if you will. And we're exploring those uh, as we do our force design work. And what are those increasing tensions is China, who is also working very hard to gain expertise, if not dominance in space, as they are in many other areas in the military. How do you see China? How is the Space Force working to make sure that it stays a step ahead in the space domain? Yeah, well, first of all, our, uh, it's clear that China is our pacing challenge. Uh, and, and we are focused on, on that challenge. Uh, and and uh, we've got some great opportunities uh, that, that we're working hard to leverage as we build this service. And it's, it's being very collaborative. Space is a global domain. And so one of the big things that we've been focusing on is developing partnerships globally. Uh, it's, it's a key part of what we call integrated deterrence, which is kind of a, a key uh, tenant in our national defense strategy. And so we're, we've been working very hard at, at, at continuing to build and foster uh, existing relationships and, and, uh, and, and enter into new partnerships uh, as well. And I think that's one of the, the big uh, wins that I would say that we've had is after establishing the Space Force as an independent service, we have really upped our game in the international collaboration piece. And it's something that uh, provides us and our partners great advantage. You know, historically, we've been in the data sharing uh, business, but today we, we operate together, we train together. When we stood up US Space Command, we stood up a, a combined command. Uh, so we, we again operate together, we train together, we exercise together. And now for the first time, we're really building capabilities together. We had an opportunity and, and I just returned from a trip, overseas trip to Norway. We had an opportunity, uh, we had, to, uh, had a requirement to launch two communication satellites to cover the Arctic. Um, and rather than having to build satellites, uh, Norway was already building satellites. And so uh, we asked if we could put our payloads on their satellites. They agreed. That saved us uh, over $900 million and will get us onto orbit three years faster than if we had to start, start from scratch. That's one example of where uh, these partnerships are, are paying dividends. And we see more of this. Uh, we're working more of these as we speak, and, and I think more of these will materialize uh, in the future. So I would say Partnerships with allies and partners is, is a key part of uh, our competition. The other thing is we have a, a great relationship with commercial industry. And one of the great advantages that I see is, is the U.S. commercial industry. I, wouldn't, I would never bet against our, our industry. They're innovative. They're, they're moving fast. And we're working hard to develop uh, a, a more fused relationship, if you will, with, with both traditional and non-traditional uh, commercial partners as, as we move forward. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, and probably the most significant priority that we have over the next decade or so, is is shifting our, or is focusing on resilience and making sure that that the the satellites that we have not only are the world's best satellites, but they are they are also resilient to a threat, and capitalizing on both commercial partnerships and, and uh, international partnerships, we're doing the force design work to proliferate our architectures in a way, just like you would do your fi financial portfolios. So if one stock took a hit, you, you wouldn't go broke. We're, we're looking to diversify uh, our portfolio and doing so again in partnership with uh, commercial industry and with our allies and partners. And so those are kind of three things that I would highlight. The, and then the last one, I, I guess I would also highlight is we're attracting incredible talent in the Space Force, absolutely incredible talent. Uh, the biggest advantage that we've had after uh, establishing the Space Force is the talent that we're attracting. We are the, both in numbers and in capability. Uh, we have got a lot of people knocking on our door. We're being very selective uh, uh, on who we bring in. In fact, uh, the Air Force Academy uh, over the last you know, two years ago, we had 100 and, 116 folks come in directly, get commissioned directly into the Space Force. And then uh, last year we, we capped it at about 100 because uh, we only bring in several hundred, several hundred a year. And so we're seeing both numbers and talent levels, uh, both on the officer side and the enlisted side, 
uh, really go through the roof. We just had our first ever direct assessment from industry where we, we brought uh, a, a young uh, officer who who is now an officer into the Space Force going through OTS right now and brought her in as a, as a first lieutenant based on experience that she had in industry. We have identified uh, five others that will come in and everything from a first lieutenant all the way up to a lieutenant colonel. And so we're going to do more of that as, as we progress forward as well. And besides those great partnerships with our allies and commercial actors, uh, to get that talent and to make sure we're staying ahead on innovation, you've also done a great job of partnering with universities across the land. We have. That's another area that, that we're really proud of. We have a, a strong university partnership program uh, that we established. Uh, we have about uh, 16 university partners that will that will uh, will sign MOE, MOAs this year. Uh, everything from universities uh, like the University of North Dakota, uh, which is our first one, MIT. Uh, uh, Stanford and, and others, and uh, Howard, North Carolina, a and UTEP. Uh, there's a, a strong, strong university partnership program. And what that's allowing us to do is two things. One, it's allowing us to, to uh, develop talent in those schools that, that have uh, really uh, uh, strong STEM-related uh, uh, curriculums. And so that's, although we're not exclusively STEM, we're, we're it's a significant portion of our force. And so it's allowing us to develop talent. Uh, the other thing that it's doing is it's allowing us to partner for research. And so we now have a consortium of, of universities that can help us solve some of our tough problems uh, that we're working on through uh, research uh, partnerships to be had as well. And so on both of those fronts, uh, people development and research, uh, we think this partnership with a network of universities that we have that spreads across the across the country uh, is going to be something that's going to deliver advantage for our nation. And I'm pleased that the University of Colorado is also part of that uh, grouping as well. They absolutely are. Another thing that you've done on talent is just how you set up Space Force in the beginning. You had a key focus on making sure it was agile, taking out two layers, and flat and responsive and a digital service, but you also focused from the beginning on the talent piece and established your guardian ideal to center that on. Maybe talk a little bit more about how talent was sort of at your center of attention as you established Space Force. Right, I, so we, you know, we were given an opportunity, a, a significant opportunity, as I mentioned in the very beginning of this, to establish a service to be able to move at speed to, to make sure that we uh, can compete to turn win in, in the space domain, just like all other services do in their respective domains. And so uh, I, I saw two risks. One is if we didn't think bold enough, and two is when we thought bold that we'd have trouble getting that uh, to fruition. And uh, we've had been very successful on, on both fronts. I, I, what I have learned is if you bring one person in the Space Force or if you had a million people in the Space Force, uh, you have to have the machinery to be able to do that. You have to be able to uh, recruit and assess and, and develop and promote and retire uh, folks. And all of that had to be built uh, for this new service. At the same time, uh, we didn't want to just do business the way we've always done business. We wanted to take an opportunity to build this service uh, for today. And so the Guardian our Ideal was our way of, of putting out a vision uh, of, of a, a unique and fresh approach to talent management. One of the one of the things that we have uh, an opportunity on uh, is that you know we're we're a small service. So today you know, we've got uh, over you know, just coming up on 8,000 guardians. A little shy of that, but by the end of this year we'll have 8,400 active duty guardians. We have about an equal number of civilians, a little less, but about an equal number of civilians. And so if you have a force that has 16,000 folks that are in it, uh, both active duty and, and civilians you can apply a little bit more art than science when it comes to uh, personnel policies and, 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 and professional development. And because you can, you got the luxury, you're, you're small enough and you don't have, the machine doesn't have to take over to be able to, to, to manage that, that talent pool. And so we're looking at innovative ways to be able to have a connection with each and every guardian, give them more choices 
uh, and attract talent that that traditionally might not have been attracted to come into come into a military. I, I get that a lot. I, I I hear a lot from from folks that you know I would never join the military, but boy, I want to join the Space Force. And you know, the first thing is to remind them we are the military, but we have a, a vision out there that allows us to apply that art and to develop our folks in a way. Uh, that, that we think is critical to the success of our service. We, th we would like to have, give people uh, opportunities to, to work with commercial industry and come back into the Space Force, to work with the other sectors of space and come back in. We'd like to offer opportunities if, if uh, uh, they're in certain times in their life where they need, they go part-time for a while, then they go part-time and then come back to full-time. And so we're, we're laying all that out uh, in, in, a, in this vision that we call the Guardian Ideal uh, and we're in the process now of, of working through the implementation of that uh, each and every day to, to, to uh, provide all those guardians. Uh, every one of the guardians that came into our service volunteered. And so whether if you're a space, space operator uh, that was in the Air Force, uh, you had to volunteer to come in, although your job was going to the Space Force. If you're an acquisition professional or an intelligence professional or a cyber professional um, or an engineer, you had choices of whether you're going to stay in the Air Force or you're going to come into the into the Space Force. We also have now uh, coming up on 700 or 800 uh, inner service transfers that are coming in from other services. And they had a choice and they made a decision to transfer from the services that they had been a part of into the Space Force. So we want to make sure that that uh, we live up to the expectations and uh, of those guardians that have volunteered to, to make a transition from what they were doing into the Space Force and and give them uh, uh, an opportunity to be part of something new and build something fresh from the ground up. And as part of building that talent and moving it forward, you've worked hard on a culture. How do you establish a, a supreme de corps? There's a culture of all of our military branches. You're the youngest. You're starting out from the ground. It begins with the logo and the flag and the uniforms that you've all established, but what, what efforts and what focus have you had in establishing that culture for the Space Force? Yeah, Mark, it's a great question. And I, and I don't know if we have it right yet, but I, I get asked a lot, um, you know, when are you gonna have your culture done? It's not something that I think just materializes. I, I, it's not something that you can order on Amazon Prime and get it overnight. Uh, what we want, we, we know there are some, some significant first principles, if you will, that, that we're trying to get after. One, we want to have a war fighting culture. Uh, two, we want to have a culture that is bold and innovative and, and, and can uh, move at speed. Uh, uh, three, we want to have a culture that is, is a connected culture that, that, again, with this small force, that there's a connection here and that we can, that we can uh, take care of our guardians in a way that, uh, because, of our, because of our size. And so as we looked at that, and then we started bringing in people from other services. We want to get them on board as well, because uh, not that the Air Force had a bad culture. We want to take the best of, of each one of those services and bring them in to, to mold this culture for us. One of the things that, that we're going to do uh, here in a, an upcoming uh, conference that we have coming up in October, I think uh, now that we've got the teams assembled and, and all the major muscle movements in place, and we know some of the, the first principles that we want to get after, now we're going to look at how do you engineer that culture? What types of steps can we take to make sure that we just don't put this on autopilot and we arrive somewhere uh, that, that we are that we purposely move uh, to that direction? Figure out what's important and then how to, and then figure out how to engineer it. And that's work that we're going to do here uh, beginning uh, this next month. Now you mentioned that part of the culture was being a war fighting culture. And it's sometimes hard for people to understand what, what does war fighting mean in space? If I could ask you to address two questions. Relative to the allies, uh, what have you done to work on establishing the norms of good behavior in space? And also help us understand uh, that, that war fighting. I know a lot of it's perhaps something we cannot talk about in a public setting, but we do know that there's been anti-satellite tests by both the Chinese and the Russians, and there's many other electronic means where we could face conflict in space. If you could help us understand on both the norms and the warfighting side, that would be great. Yeah, first of all, I, I think it's clear 
that uh, space is a warfighting domain, just like all other other domains, air, land, sea. Um, it's it's a warfighting domain, and so um, it's the it's the newest of those, if you will, uh, it, it, as the, as it has shifted from a benign domain to this warfighting domain. Uh, things like that that other domains have, like what are what is safe and professional behavior in space? Uh, what are rules of engagement? What's what what would you consider hostile intent? Uh, what are the norms of behavior? All of those things that have matured and developed over the years in uh, in other domains are ne now have to be formulated in this in this space. It, it requires a new way of developing people. It requires new capabilities. It requires new uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And so all of that is the work that the Space Force is doing uh, to be able to, again, provide capabilities that benefit uh, our average American, our, our nation, and clearly our, our joint and coalition forces. Uh, there is a spectrum of, of threats that, that are concerning. Everything from reversible jamming of GPS satellites and communication satellites to directed energy threats to very visible threats uh, here uh, when, for example, China and Russia both launched a missile from the ground and, and blown up a satellite uh, in space into multiple pieces of debris. So there's a whole spectrum of threats that, that uh, we're focusing on to make sure that, that that the capabilities that, that fuel uh, our nation uh, are always there. And that with new technologies such as servicing satellites and extending their lives and having extra people up in space makes that job, I'm sure, only more difficult. And also, it, it does, but it also makes it, it gives us a lot more opportunities as well. The commercial. What what used to historically what used to be commercially viable in space were very large communication satellites and commercial launch. Uh, today, uh, as as I mentioned earlier, as the barriers to entry have been reduced, uh, and, and more uh, more objects are being launched into space, uh, you now that are that are operationally relevant. You now have multiple missions that that are uh, are now commercially viable, and I think that provides us. Uh, great opportunity and so that's why that partnership with commercial industry is so important that we can leverage uh, them to and leverage the business model that they have to be able to to, to make the transition from uh, the, the exquisite capabilities that we have today to a, a more hybrid architecture that's more proliferated to be more resilient uh, in the face of the of the capabilities that I had talked about previously uh, so I think I think it is a very complex domain. It's a, it's a, it's an exciting time. You know, a couple of years ago, if we were talking, I would have told you that we were tracking about 22,000 objects in space, roughly. Uh, today, that number is nearing 50,000 objects. Uh, I would have told you a couple of years ago that of those 22,000 objects, uh, about 1,500 were satellites. Today, that uh, that number is close to 5,000 satellites. And so we're seeing a lot more, and, and the projections are that that's going to increase. We, we think at Cape Canaveral uh, alone this year, uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, do well over 60 launches just out of, Cape, out of Cape Canaveral. And the numbers, if you look at the projections, the manifest projections going forward, uh, those are going to continue to, to uh, increase in the years ahead. Now, those number of objects were multiplied and added to by those anti-satellite tests. And we've received lots of questions here at the Wilson Center and concern about space debris and what are the path forward to make sure that we're managing that in the best way possible. I know you see a role for Commerce Department and other areas outside of Space Force in that. Maybe give us your view on space debris and, and how we keep it from being too much of a problem going forward. Yeah. So. Um... I think one of the, and I've said this many times in the past, one of the, one of the ways that you, you help resolve the space debris challenge is not to create the debris in the first place. And so, um, you know, the United States uh, back in April uh, committed to not conducting uh, uh, destructive direct ascent anti-satellite tests. Again, to, to act in, in a responsible way and not, and not create debris. We act as the space traffic control for the world. Uh, we we track every object and do the analytical work on every other object to make sure that two things don't collide. And if two things are going to collide, we provide a warning 
and recommend that somebody maneuver to keep those satellites from colliding. We had a collision back in 2008 time frame uh, between two satellites that caused another 3,000 pieces of debris. So we, we act as that space traffic control for the world. We've increased our engineering standards to so when you do launches, you don't uh, litter the, the domain with debris as a satellite comes off of a rocket. We've increased engineering standards so when satellites reach the end of their life, they don't break apart into multiple pieces of, of debris. And so all of those things that we've put in place are all getting after uh, uh, making sure that, that we can uh, help solve the debris problem by not creating it. I think norms of behavior is also a significant, another significant step that can be very helpful in managing this, this domain that has is, is gone through a, an incredible transformation over the last, last couple of years. And then we're also exploring options on how might you uh, do some debris, debris removal from, from the domain. And we've got, uh, we set up an organization called SpaceWorks that's that's looking through that as one of the one of the areas that they're focusing on. But all of that put together, uh, space is a really big place. Uh, there's a lot of objects up there. Uh, there's a lot of objects too small for us to track. They're moving at a very fast pace uh, just to, to stay in the domain, and it's a challenge that that uh, we all are going to have to address. And the way you do it is is uh, to largely keep from creating that debris in the first place. Indeed. And there's been a proliferation in low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, in addition to up in the geospatial. Um, a lot of people are concerned that we may run out of space to launch those rockets out of Canaveral or Kennedy Space Center or out at uh, Vandenberg. Uh, how concerned are you that with the proliferation of satellites, particularly low Earth orbit, that we'll lose our ability to, to find launch opportunities. Yeah, I'm not overly concerned on that. Uh, for at the time being, I, I we space is a big place, and and there are opportunities to do launches. As I've told you, the, the launch rate here has gone up considerably. Um, in fact, I, I highlighted just this past month, uh, we did two launches out of Cape Canaveral in 13 hours. First time we've done that since 1967. We launched a, a, a space force missile warning satellite in the morning and then and then a commercial company launched a, a communication satellite uh, that that early evening and then in two other places in around the world one in texas a commercial company launched uh, uh, commercial astronauts uh, into into uh, into space and then uh, another u.s launch was done uh, out of new zealand so uh, you know four launches in one day uh, so there's there's opportunities to launch. We have the means to be able to understand what's up in in the domain, uh, to be able to track that and to conduct those launches safely. That's one of the one of the functions that we provide, and it's one of the functions that we also help support our our allies and partners on as well. I should have said geostationary, but speaking about launches, NASA's got a big launch coming up, uh, do. and we've been talking about partners. Tell us about how NASA is a partner and how the types of things that they're doing are beneficial to the Space Force and vice versa? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, they've got a really exciting launch coming up. It's the, the launch of uh, Artemis One, which is the, the first launch of the rocket that will, will take the, the US and its partners uh, back to the moon. Um, it's They're gonna do an attempt uh, this Saturday. Uh, the partnership that we have, and I think if you look at that launch, that's one area where the partnership comes alive, and that's on launch day on the range. And so uh, NASA launches off of, uh, for this launch, uh, will launch off of a, a U.S. Space Force range, which will help uh, conduct that launch in a safe in a safe manner. Uh, and so that's one area, and that's probably an area that we have really close relationships with them on as in launch. The other is on the protection of the International Space Station. So we, we actually have NASA elements that sit side by side with us to do that conjunction analysis so we can protect the International Space Station and we can protect those astronauts uh, that are on orbit uh, from any potential collision with a piece of debris uh, that, that may uh, be in space. We also uh, uh, work and we provide uh, military officers to NASA uh, to serve as a NASA astronaut. So they transfer to NASA and, and while they're there, they're, they're part of NASA and they, they serve as astronauts. We've got two of those uh, 
as NASA astronauts that, that are Space Force officers that have been again assigned assigned to NASA as, a, as an astronaut. We're, we also look at uh, training opportunities. You know, we both operate in the same domain. And so we, uh, some of the simulators and training capabilities we look at partnering with. We, we both share the same industrial base. Uh, we both have a desire for norms of behavior. Uh, NASA has something that they call the Artemis Accords, which is uh, a, a, an accord that they're signing with their partners in the, in the Artemis launch program to, to spell out uh, norms for their partnerships. We also uh, are working on norms of behavior with our international partners. We also uh, share partners. You know, um, NASA has strong partnerships around the world. In the national security space business, that's not something that uh, historically we uh, we had a lot of. We, we really didn't need them at the time. The, the main was safe and peaceful. And again, that's not the case today. And we're really working those international partnerships hard and an area of great uh, advancement for us. And so on a whole host of fronts, uh, we partner with NASA. I think though it's very important to realize it's two distinct missions. NASA is about science and exploration and the Space Force is a, is a military service focusing on uh, providing capabilities uh, and the security for which uh, others can then flourish in, inside the domain. And so two different missions, but close partnerships on a whole, on a whole host of fronts. And I wish NASA uh, all the best on Saturday. This is a really important launch, and we're very proud of the partnership uh, that we enjoy with NASA. As a guy named Kennedy who grew up going to the elementary school cafeteria to watch all the launches uh, NASA did, we're, we're certainly wishing them the very best. You know, I, you know, Mark, I, I too, I didn't, uh, I, I was a, a young boy when, when the, um, uh, we first walked on the moon. And I, I remember being very inspired uh, sitting on the, my living room floor uh, at West Point, New York, uh, watching, uh, watching uh, the Apollo 11 mission. I remember right after that, turning around and going to our dining room, which was in, in just in back of me, and, uh, and building an Apollo model. Uh, and, and if you look today at what's going on in all sectors of space, whether it's NASA, again, going to the moon and then on to Mars, whether you look at what's going on in the commercial uh, industry with all that's happening in space. And then if you look at what's going on in national security space in all sectors, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot lot happening. And what we're seeing that translate into uh, is more people being interested in coming into this business. Uh, there's more, more folks going to universities getting STEM related degrees associated with space. As I mentioned, we've got more people knocking on our door wanting to be part of this. Uh, and I think that's gonna provide us some really good, uh, really good advantage for our nation as we go forward. And I'm, I'm uh, excited to be part of this. Uh, there's no doubt that we have a challenge in this nation in our competition with others in STEM education. And we certainly all hope that what NASA is doing, what you're doing, inspires more to pursue a, a STEM career. Now you sure. mentioned that NASA focuses on science and discovery but within the realm of security, you're also focused on that as well and have worked hard at establishing test capabilities and range capabilities. And there's a lot going on in that, that area right now. Maybe talk a little bit about the importance of, of tests and ranges. Yes, sir. Uh, so when we, when we established the Space Force, uh, we, again, we wanted to do this in a very, without a lot of bureaucracy. We wanted to really keep, keep the organization flat uh, really be able to move at speed, uh, really be innovative. And as, as I talked to a lot of uh, folks that were in the organiz organization design business, everybody told me big organizations are slow. And so we and cut our initial planning size on our, on our staffs. And we took, as you mentioned up front, two layers of command out of, out of our structure. Yeah. We uh, reduced uh, a numbered Air Force command which is a three-star command, and we and we got we had two O six commands previously, and we got we went down to one, and that flattened structure has really enabled us, uh, really provided us some good advantage. Uh, one of the things though that when we built this, we built three field commands that were underneath the, the overarching space force. One of them was focused on operations, and uh, that's called the space operations command. One of them is focused on acquiring capabilities and acquiring capabilities in a new way. 
uh, and to be able to move at speed again in close partnerships with industry and, and our allies. And we, we uh, call that Space Systems Command. That's out in Los Angeles. The third field command that we stood up was called Star Command, Space Training and Readiness Command. Uh, they they do not only our, 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 our training and readiness and doctrine, but they also do testing. As we look to, to pivot our architectures from, from handfuls of, of very large, very exquisite satellites to more proliferated uh, design, uh, we must be able to test those capabilities and get them onto orbit uh, in the tactical timelines that we need. And so one of the things that we're focusing on is building this service as a digital service. Uh, being able to, uh, we, we think we're probably a little too hardware focused and we, we needed it more software focused. So we built, uh, we're raising the digital fluency across the force. Uh, we have built uh, what we call super coders that are software uh, developers that are now organic to our, to our service. And we've adopted uh, digital engineering as the way forward uh, for, for uh, doing this, this, uh, this pivot. Everything from the design of the architecture to the requirements, to the actual acquisition of the satellite system, to the testing of that system, then to the training of the crews that will operate those capabilities are all being done with, with a digital thread. I don't want to overstate it. We're in the early stage of this, but we've done our first design work that's been done digitally. We're, we're developing, finalizing the development of the, of the digital requirements as part of the, the directive that we have to, to be the joint force integrated for requirements across the department. And we see um, that digital thread being really important uh, for us to be able to, again, acquire those systems, the right systems, uh, and get them onto orbit uh, when we need them. And this, this new command that we stood up called Star Command is something that's uh, really uh, already proving its worth. And, and they just celebrated their first birthday uh, a week or two ago having that digital thread could have great positive ramifications. Not hard, not easy to do, but certainly a big benefit. I'd like to now turn to the questions that we're getting from our audience. Scott, I think it's Susie uh, with the U.S. Global Leadership Council is asking about the role that Space Force plays in diplomacy. I know you're putting some attaches and some embassies Maybe talk a bit about how you see Space Force's role in the act of diplomacy. Yeah, so uh, we, you know, first of all, space is a global domain and that requires global partnerships. We are, are actually not building space out of space. We have space experts that are, that are uh, uh, embedded in, uh, in some of the embassies around the world and, and we're, we're providing some specialized training for them as we, again, continue to ramp up our ability to, to do uh, partnerships. But, but again, we're, we're small in numbers. Uh, we just want to make sure that the folks that we have out there for deployed in embassies uh, are trained uh, to a level to, to do that job well. We're also doing a lot of work. I talked about partnerships. We're doing a lot of work with NATO. Uh, a, couple, uh, a couple years ago, back in uh, 2019, I think it was... Uh, uh, October of 2019, uh, NATO uh, declared space an operational domain. Uh, and so we're, we're working very closely with NATO. And at, after uh, declaring space an operational domain, they, they published a space strategy. They've uh, stood up a space center of excellence or in the process of standing up a space center of excellence in Toulouse, France. Uh, they've stood up a space command and control uh, capability in, at, in Germany. And so we're embedding uh, with those NATO functions uh, to, to develop that, that close tie. And additionally, we have uh, put a Space Force a general officer in, uh, in NATO at, on the staff at NATO. And so that's another area where we're working uh, with our close partners to be able to do that. The way that I think we can help with diplomacy, and again, that's, uh, we're on the military side of it, but we're working very closely with our partners to, to demonstrate safe and responsible uh, behavior in the domain and to set, set an example for others to follow. I think that, uh, and, and then again, continuing to, to attract partners from around the globe, I think also helps, helps with our efforts as well. And Peter Morrison from the Office of Naval Research is wondering about directed energy. Uh, what type of threats you 
see that as being and, and how you're working with directed energy, weapons and other functions? Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna get into specifics on, on those types of, of programs. I would tell you that there is uh, obviously concern uh, when you're when you're dealing with space capabilities, uh, directed energy could be a could be a threat that you one of those threats again in that spectrum of threats from reversible jamming to kinetic disruption that, that we have to be concerned about. And we have Frank Tedeschi, uh, who is a staffer with Senator Rounds out of South Dakota, asking about overclassification, and you've talked about this before about if you really want to deter, which is what would be our ideal state, we'd prefer never to get into a conflict, but if you want to deter, how is overclassification hurting on that? He also specifically mentions it being a, a barrier to entry for some businesses engaging with threats that, or requirements that they don't really know about and the possibility of duplication because of, of that lack of understanding. Maybe talk about how you're wrestling with the overclassification issue? Yeah. Well, first of all, all the th things that uh, that that question laid out, I agree with. I I think we are too overly classified. Uh, I do think that that causes us uh, challenges. And if you again focus on the national defense strategy, with, at the core of that being integrated deterrence, it's really hard to deter if you can't. Uh, uh, change the deterrence calculus, and one of the means to do that is messaging. And so it's important to us uh, for a whole host of reasons, the deterrence part, plus all the things that the, that the gentleman that asked the question uh, laid out. Uh, the, the National Defense Authorization Act this past year directed the department to do a review of all space uh, classification, uh, classification of space systems, OSD policy uh, is, is, leading that, is leading that effort. We have had some uh, success uh, of declassifying are reducing the classification of, of uh, some space programs uh, that, that has been helpful. Um, it has helped us integrate more effectively with our, with our other services. It's helped us uh, integrate. It will help us integrate with our, with our allies and partners as well. Um, we have worked very hard when we stood up the Combined Force Space Component Command, again, as part of U.S. Space Command, which I don't command today. When we stood that up, that really helped us sharpen the focus on making sure that we can, um, that we can uh, uh, share the right information with, with our allies and partners. And, that, and we've made some progress on that front as well. And then finally, on the force design work that we're doing, um, we're, we're, we are also doing that design with the mind of, of collaboration and sharing from the outset. And we have shared with our closest partners the design work that we've done uh, on our highest priority missions that, uh, again, with the hope of, of being able to attract partners and, and, and add to the integrated deterrence. There, but I will say, having said all that, uh, there is still more work to do and it's, a, it's important work that, that has to get done. Thank you. Um, Amy Sterling, a scientist with Princeton, is asking if you could think about or talk about what could space force unlock? What types of things are we going to see in 10 years from now that are a result of what Space Force does over those 10 years that will uh, create opportunities and other benefits to the American people that we don't have today? So I, I, again, I think uh, we're, we're at a really exciting time where uh, the access, the barriers to entry to space have been reduced. We're going to see more and more capabilities uh, get launched into orbit. Uh, we'll be able to experiment with those capabilities. Uh, we'll be able to integrate those capabilities to effect. I, I think having a secure uh, domain allows industry to flourish, allows exploration to flourish. I think uh, the, the next decade or so coming up is a, a truly remarkable and exciting time where we're going to we're going to capitalize on uh, the, the flourishing of active flourishment of activities that are that are taking place today. You know, back in the day, I've heard stories, and I, I, yeah, I think it's they're true uh, that you know, uh, back in the day, the military wanted to kill GPS. Pretty short-sighted, obviously, if you look at what GPS does for our for our world. So a lot of this is is getting capabilities onto orbit and then figuring out the 
the value of those capabilities. And, and I, I think uh, with technology, uh, with, with uh, the amount of activity that's going on in the domain, we're going we're gonna to unlock uh, a lot of capabilities that, that would be valuable for our nation. I think you will as well. And as NASA focuses on not just going back to the moon, but uh, establishing longer term, perhaps people living on the moon, the domain of space and what you're going to need to wrestle with is only going to grow. Yes, sir. I, it became really clear uh, when we first started off building the Space Force that we're not just building the Space Force for today. We're building the Space Force for a service that can thrive for the next you know, hundreds of years. And so if you look at, if you look at where they, our Air Force was 75 years ago, compared to where our Air Force is today, there's, there's really uh, no comparison in, in capabilities. I think you're going to see the same thing hold true in the space domain and, and maybe even, uh, even at, a, at a much faster pace based on what's going on and, and based on the technologies, uh, the information technologies that are being developed. As you think of that evolution of the Space Force moving forward, uh, and you embed your hopes and dreams for what it ultimately becomes in that, what are the challenges that you see the nation facing in space and in Space Force facing as an organization as it evolves, you know, five, ten years into the future? I think uh, one of the big, it, it's, I, I tend to focus more on the opportunities than the, than the challenges. There's, there's a ton of challenges out there. Uh, but I, I'm convinced uh, that uh, if we build this service right uh, and we build it for today, not just iterating from where we were in the future, uh, that's really what's going to uh, going to be uh, provide us the, the advantages that we need. The challenge with that is we're a small service. You know, again, 16,000 people in roughly uh, by the end of this year both uh, active duty and civilian. That provides us some opportunities to go fast. At the same time, uh, we operate inside of a, of a large bureaucracy. And so balancing that, having enough mass to be able to get the important work done that we need to get done, but not being so large, uh, and we're nowhere near that today, uh, not being too large that slows us down is the balance that I think we've got to get right. And that's something that we'll continue to focus on uh, in, in the years ahead. But I think there's way more opportunities than challenges. And that, that's what excites me each and every day. That coupled with the, the quality of guardians that I have the privilege of serving with each and every day. Uh, as I mentioned up front, we have incredible talent and I, I couldn't be more proud of, of the work they've done in just you know, less, you know, two years and eight months or so, I guess, uh, since we were established. And if you look at all that has occurred in that period of time, it's pretty remarkable. And if you think back on it, the initial plan that the Air Force had for the Space Force was if a law was passed and if a Space Force was going to be established, the, the initial planning that happened said we're, we were going to stand up, you know, the law would be signed, and then 18 months later, we were going to kind of get to work. We were going to continue to plan for 18 months and then really move out. When the law was signed, it said effective tonight, you're up and run it. And I'm glad it said that because we we've had two years and eight months or so worth of incredible accomplishments, building a service that is critical, critical for our national security, critical for uh, every American uh, and, and all of our partners around the, uh, around the globe. And I, I couldn't be more proud of the work that they're doing uh, each and every day. I think we're all proud of what they're doing and you should be proud of the dizzying pace that you've kept over that three year period to get from time go uh, to today. You mentioned the Air Force and their plans. As we've watched and observed the great close working relationship that you have with Secretary Kendall and with General C.Q. Brown, I think that is also uh, both a credit to all three of you, but uh, been a key to making the progress that we have achieved. Yeah, I, Mark, I, and I appreciate you saying that because I, I, I can't uh, close out to that today without one, congratulating the Air Force on 75 years, their 75th uh, birthday coming up here just in a few weeks. I was a, an airman for, for uh, 35 and a half years. And, and the partnership that we enjoy today with the Air Force uh, is, is incredible. And I give a lot of credit to the two gentlemen that you mentioned. Our secretary, Secretary Kendall has uh, uh, make sure that, that we 
we're one team, one fight, if you will. And, and CQ Brown and I have been friends uh, since the mid nineties when we were air command and staff college classmates together. Uh, and it, it just been a great partner. And I think he would, he would echo this. That if you take, I think our air force is better now that we have an independent space force. And I think our space force is better now that it's, it's an independent service as well. And I think if you were to add one plus one, you get five, not, not two. And uh, I think that uh, we, we recognize that. Uh, I'm really privileged to serve with, with uh, CQ Brown and very privileged to, to serve under the leadership of our, of our secretary, uh, who is really making sure that that, that uh, integration between our two services uh, stays very tight. It is important that we recognize the 75th anniversary of the Air Force. And one of the memories I have during my time in Congress was having a group of middle schoolers sing all the branch songs and having a 12 or 14 year old young lady say, give her the gun with uh, a lot of enthusiasm that clearly reflects the pride that she had. But I think all Americans have in our Air Force and the, and the heritage that they bring to this day and will carry into the future. But I have every bit of confidence that the Space Force will have that same proud heritage 70 years, 72 years from now, as we, we move into the future. And a key part, about, key part of that success is getting that foundation right that we've talked about here, about having that culture, having that focus on talent, having that focus on agile and quick, and uh, being a service to the other branches and working in a collaborative nature, not just with them, but with allies, with NASA, with commercial partners, with universities. You've done a great work in establishing Space Force and putting it on its path. And we appreciate you giving us your insights today and your service to our nation. And I'll just maybe give you the, the last word. Thanks again for being, us, being with us here at the Wilson Center. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us here today. All right, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity and, and I really appreciate uh, the dialogue that we had. Uh, I I want to give all the credit to the team that, that I've been privileged to lead. It's it's an incredible team. Uh, they they come to work every day, focus on what we need to get done. We understand the, the urgency of, of getting this done and doing it right. Uh, we've had great partnerships across the department. We've, we've got strong relationships uh, uh, with, with Congress and administration. And again, uh, this is a team sport and we're, we're uh, proud to be teammates with a whole lot of folks. So again, greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity today and look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you all. Thank you, General Raymond. Thank you from the Wilson Center.